So it's uh, the presentation is Fly Me to the Moon, which is I discuss in the book. It's the fantasy flights uh, that that appeared. So let me uh, go down. Okay, this is a gentleman I dedicate my talks to. Uh, most of you probably knew Mike uh, when he was the director of Chabot, Old Chabot, and then uh, first director of the Space and Science Center up in the hills there. Uh, Mike was the, uh, the head of the ALPO, which is the Association of Lunar and Planetary Observers, uh, our transit section. And I was going to go to Florida last November to see the transit of Mercury and visit Mike. And unfortunately, he passed away in October of last year. I did get to see the, uh, the transit with, uh, with other friends. Uh, you'll notice there's a space shuttle over his shoulder. Mike was the runner up to Christy McAuliffe. And if she hadn't beat him out, Mike would have been on Challenger uh, when it blew up. So we are lucky uh, that he survived that. Before Mike was selected as part of that uh, teacher in space, he had been the uh, teacher, uh, in teacher of the year in Florida. So uh, I don't know, I miss him a lot. I think we all do, those of us who knew him. He was quite an inspirational guy. And so uh, I, again, dedicate my talks to, to Mike's memory. Uh, here's a certificate from uh, the uh, asteroid being named. Uh, I was at a, at a uh, International Lunars Conference in Toulouse, France. And the day after the conference is when I got the notification that uh, the asteroid had been renamed. Okay, there's the cover of the book. <clears throat> One of the things that I like is um, up here, the O coming out from behind the moon, uh, which we call an occultation when the moon or uh, asteroid moves in front of a star or the moon covers a planet or some other object. And here what they, Springer made the cover, okay? And so they have the O for occultation coming out from behind the moon. Okay, the first uh, known story of a trip to the moon that still survives or may have been an earlier one, we can't say for sure, that uh, is long gone, it was by Lucian uh, Samosota. Uh, he lived in the second century. We don't know much about him. Uh, and it's called the Vera Historia, meaning the true story. The funny thing is, is that Lucian in the first sentence or two, he tells you nothing in the story is true. I made up everything, not, yet it's called the true history. Um, he and his crew, <coughs> excuse me, they first sail out through the uh, gates of Gibraltar, Straits of Gibraltar, in those days was the Straits of Hercules. And they land in an island out in the Atlantic where the river is full of wine and fish and bears. And uh, the funny thing about the, uh, this island is there are no women. The women are trees. And uh, he loses two of his men uh, within the trees. Uh, that's as far as I'm going to get as far as, you know, dirtiness or whatever. Um, so they get sucked up by a whirlwind up to the moon by the vortex. And there's a war going on between the kings of the sun and the moon over colonization of Venus. And uh, the uh, uh, Lucian's people, they take the, <clears throat> take the sides of the moon, which is led by Endemion, who you know is the, uh, a Greek uh, mythological character. And they get back down uh, to the ocean and they get swallowed by a 200 mile long whale. And after being in there for months, they finally light a bonfire inside. Now, he doesn't tell how they actually got home because he says at the end of the story, I'll tell you in the, in the second book. Well, the joke as far as scholars is that he never wrote the second book. So now th this painting hangs in the Palace of the Legion of Honor in San Francisco. And that is <clears throat> Endemion sleeping. Endemion was cursed by Zeus to perpetual sleep. Now, although this one is Diana, there's a similar painting in the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam, which is Selene. Now, Selene is the Greek name 
for the goddess of the moon. Diana is the Latin name. And I'll talk more of Selene because throughout the talk, that word shows up several times. So this was a painting done in 1726. You have Diana. Now, being bare-breasted, she was a goddess of fertility. And in art, that is shown when a woman is shown as bare-breasted, she's representing fertility. Now look at the cusp of the moon. Uh, we never get the moon with a cusp like this, okay? And you have Eris or Cupid shooting a an arrow, a love arrow into Endymion. Now you have down here in the bottom, a hunting horn. He has a spear and his hunting dog and here's a quiver with more spears. The problem is, is that uh, Diana <clears throat> or Selene would come down to visit and Demian while he was sleeping, and she bore 50 daughters. The poor boy missed out on all the fun, so to speak. Well, the 50 daughters represents the 50 months in the lunar solar calendar at that time between the ancient Greek Olympiads. So there is some symbolism there in, in that respect. So, uh, like I said, this is, this is a large painting. As you can see, it's uh, 78 inches tall by 51 inches wide. And the arc is the top of the frame. Uh, I advise you know, go over there to the palace and take a look at it. Or if you go to the Rijksmuseum, like I said, there's one very similar. Okay, now there's a crater on the moon in Demian. Uh, this image by Howard Eskeldison uh, that he took in 2011. The crater is about 122 kilometers. It's kind of, as you're looking at the moon, it would be up to the uh, uh, the right corner. And it was one of the craters, the first crater name that still sticks uh, by uh, Langrenus uh, in his first map that he made in 1644. And this is one of three craters that still carry the name that he named it. All the other names that he applied have been moved to somewhere else or dropped. So this name, Pythagoras, and the crater that he named for himself uh, still carry the name from 400 years ago. Okay, so let's get to some of the fantasy flights. Uh, one, another early one is the man in the moon or the discourse of the voyage thither of Domingo Gonzalez, the speedy messenger. And this is where we get the name Speedy Gonzalez. Okay, so it was uh, a book written by a British historian and Anglican bishop named Francis Goodwin, although it's printed under a uh, false name. Um, and what it is is that he's powered by swans up here in the top and a sail. Now in those days they thought that there was ether connected the earth and everything in the, um, in the universe and that it was breathable. So this shows Speedy uh, being flown to the moon by 10 wild swans. Now the swans lived on the moon and would regularly migrate back to earth and back again. Um, he finds the moon people are 20 feet tall and the women are more beautiful than those on earth. Uh, these people do not die, they just simply disappear. They just vanish, no longer exist. Uh, the moon is paradise to him because there are no doctors or lawyers. Sorry about <laughs> that guys, if any of you are a doctor or lawyer. <laughs> the food, and food grows everywhere. So that's uh, some of what uh, the people were reading in the early days there. Now, this man is more famous here on the Bergerac. Uh, his book uh, in English is the comic history of the states and empires of the moon. Um, and so uh, written or published in 1656. Uh, he also had a really crazy idea in which uh, two ways of getting up. One is you'd be in a, what they call the car, which we would call the coach, uh, made out of metal. And he would throw a large magnet up and it would pull the car up. And then he'd throw the magnet again and again and again. And I'm saying, well, what's holding the car up there when you un unhook the magnet and throw the magnet higher? The other was, if you notice around his belt here, these are little bottles of dew. As you know, when dew is warmed up, the moisture evaporates and up it goes. And you see here, there's little windmills on the top and such, and the fortress. So uh, that was his way of getting up to the moon. And you see the moon up in the corner there. 
I mean, this is a an Italian language poem in in which uh, by Antonio Caputi, uh, he flourished from 1763 to 69, um, in which uh, his character Archero Florencelneo, C-S-E-L-E-N-O, like Selny, um, travels to the moon on clouds. And up in the top, you see there's a crescent moon. Uh, I don't know if all this other stuff is blocking your view of that. Um, now, WorldCat lists only nine known copies, and one of them resides in Union City, California. Uh, now, this doesn't have anything to do with flights to the moon, but it was a uh, 1690 play on, um, well, no, actually this was published in 1753, uh, which is the cause of rain on Earth. And it was a uh, play on the book Voyage to the Moon by Descartes from 1690, um, <clears throat> in which you see the sun up above reflecting off of mirrors and heating up this jar in the middle and water coming out. So here's the sun. <laughs> here's the sun heating up the water. The water would come out the top and that would cause rain on the earth. A little, a little strange, but you know, who knows? Um, so that was the effect of the sun. Uh, that's uh, the, uh, uh, the book by, the, it's by Anonymous. Uh, is somewhat rare. Okay, now this is Journey to the Moon and interesting conversations with the inhabitants respecting the condition of man in uh, 1811 by the Reverend John Campbell, who is uh, English. And you see him on his, looking through the moon with his uh, tabletop telescope, which was common in those days. Uh, he's transported up to the moon with this telescope and talks to the lunar inhabitants. And one of the interesting things being that he was a man of the cloth, uh, the inhabitants want to know if the people on earth know about God. Uh, that, that's the main thing, it's a small book. Okay, during the 16 and 1700s, there were additional fantasy flights to the moon using such things as birds, like I showed you, a flying horse, mysteriously powered flying machines. One lunar explorer searches for a friend's lost wits and brings him back to Earth. Everything um, goes back to the, the Kepler in 1630, wrote that when you die, your soul stops at the moon before going on to heaven. Now, I didn't include Kepler's book because it's not a travel log like these are. He, ta he talks about all the kinds of things about the moon and to avoid getting into trouble with uh, the church, uh, he writes it kind of scientifically, but the notes, the footnotes are longer than the actual uh, text of the book. But he avoids uh, uh, stuff that would get him in trouble like what happened uh, uh, to uh, Giordano Bruno and what would have happened to Kepler if he hadn't have died just when his book was published and what eventually did happen to uh, Galileo. And I'll talk about Galileo in a couple of minutes here. Uh, another travel log uh, in the early 1800s was written anonymously by Lord John Russell, who was a prime minister of England uh, in the early uh, 1800s. Um, we know it's by him because the copy of the book that I have was a presentation copy to a woman who was a friend of his and his signature has been verified as being John Russell's uh, signature. But anyway, he gets on the moon and he's wandering around and he finds these no large warehouse-like structures. And then he goes in and they're noisy. They're filled with everything that's lost on earth, including speeches, wife's nagging statements, memories, and of course money, because everybody's losing money all the time. Uh, and this was written a number of years after the first book where they are searching for their wits. So uh, this is a, uh, an interesting uh, book. And as he wanders around, he's finding all kinds of stuff that uh, is lost. Every, everything you lose winds up on the moon first. So 
If you lose any money, go check the moon. Now this is uh, early in the, uh, or I should say late 1700s when the uh, when Gauthier uh, developed their uh, hot air balloon. And if you notice up here, there are people in the moon and they're looking through telescopes and they're all in a panic. They're afraid that the people from uh, the earth are gonna go to the moon. And this was from uh, Camille Flammarion's book, uh, Popular Astronomy in 1890, translated as Popular Astronomy. And down here at the bottom is English, which I have, or French, which I've translated to, but fright is in the moon, where the onlookers and the ignorant judge the wandering balloon on the little common planet. I like that terminology, the little common planet. So you can see that they're all concerned about Earthlings coming up to the moon. Okay, Baron Munchausen was kind of a character uh, in Germany, and uh, he was always getting into all kinds of uh, fantastic uh, adventures. And in this one, on the over on this side, he travels up to the moon in a ship. And if you look carefully, you can see the lips of the man in the moon here, his nose and his worried eyes. He's worried about him coming up. Well, in another part of this tale, he has a silver hatchet that he throws up in the sky. Now, in those days, they thought the moon was close. In fact, the Greeks thought that if you went to the far mountains in the north, you could reach up and grab the moon. And it was only the size of what's called a helmet box. I guess that's the box you would put your helmet in. They had no concept of the size or distances and such. Well, in this case, Baron Munchen goes after his hatchet by climbing up a rope. And how he gets down is, as you can see, he cuts the rope and falls back to the earth. He's got, if you read his book, there's books about him, just all kinds of funny tales. He's always getting into, into problems. <clears throat> okay, one of the most famous books of travel is actually Jules Verne, From the Earth to the Moon. And uh, this was in uh, 1865 and with a follow-up, Round the Moon. Now this drawing is from the 1895, two volumes compressed into one volume in the American edition. Now all this, like a railroad train, is not part of the book. What they went up in a, like a bullet, most of you are familiar with it, fired like a cannon from Florida, very close to where Cape Canaveral is. Now, people think that Jules Verne was made up a lot of this stuff. Well, he was actually very in tune with the science of his day. In Round the Moon, uh, one of his, the leader is a man named Barbicane. And as they're flying over Tycho Crater, he explains about the rays. And he says, his explanation, he says, that's from James Carpenter. He explained the, what the, the rays were from. Well, Carpenter had written an article in the uh, monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society in 1844. And that's what Verne was quoting from, from uh, almost uh, 30 years earlier. So uh, again, this is not anything close to what's in the story. There's no caboose and whatnot. Uh, it was just a single bullet. Well, remember the bullet and such because <clears throat> after Verne had written his first novel and then a sequel, along came his third book, which he did not write and was not excited about. It's called the Un Mon In Canu, uh, <laughs> which means the unknown moon. Sorry about that. And the man's name, actually the pen name, is, here's that word, Selenese again. Okay. Now, I've not been able to find anything about the original uh, author's name is Dela Drabble. Uh, he just seems to have fallen off the earth, so to speak. But he has three adventures who used Jules Verne's cannon and bullet uh, to go to the moon. And they stay there for two years, uh, wandering around, 
you know where Apollo 15 landed is that Hadley Rill. Well, they happen to land in the rill and go down and down and down and down and down. And finally they run into uh, inhabitants. And so uh, uh, in order to communicate back to earth, they set up these large flashing lights in Mare Crisium, which is uh, in the central, excuse me, large um, Mare in the central part of the moon from our perspective and they flash Morse code signals. And on Earth, they set up lights in the fields just east of uh, Pikes Peak near Colorado Springs, which hit home for me because back in 1960, the Boy Scout, we had our uh, jamboree there. Uh, and there were thousands of us in the basically the same fields right near Pikes Peak and the Air Force Academy. Now, in those days, People, the, the leading theory was that the craters on the moon were actually all volcanoes. And again, Carpenter in their book in, 17, in, in 1878 had demonstrated how the volcanoes would have formed the craters. Well, after they wander around the moon, and one of the funny things is they go around on the far side and they run into an abandoned town with a Gothic church. And then they come back around and now they're a little tired and they want to go home. Uh, they move the capsule into a volcano. The volcano erupts and launches them uh, back to Earth. Vern was not happy about this book coming out because it basically um, uses his story. In those days, uh, there wasn't copyright. And so you could do that. Okay. Move on to 1902, uh, The Man in the Moon. This is the first film, and like I have on my t shirt, although you can't see it now, um, the same picture. Uh, this is the first film with a plot. Movies prior to that were just documentaries of one kind or another, parades and uh, people doing this and that, but no, uh, no plot. Now, this is the famous spaceship hitting the moons in the eye, uh, the capsule. Now I'm uh, on the, the board of directors and the membership chair for the Niles SNA Silent Film Museum. And we show movies, well, other than since the panic, the pandemic, on Saturday nights in a theater built in 1913 for silent films. We are in the process of restoring the building now, so it's kind of torn apart inside. We took off the sheetrock and there was the original plaster on the inside. We've got to redo the wiring and uh, stuff like that. But we have a picture of Charlie Chaplin standing in front of the little house next door and you see our theater. Charlie was there in Niles from January 16th to April 7, 1915. And he made five movies in Niles. The last one was The Tramp uh, in uh, Niles Canyon, the most famous picture, iconic picture of where he's walking east in the canyon. The movie opens and he's coming west and he almost gets run over. But he's, <coughs> he just lost out on his love of his life, uh, which was Edna Proviance, her fiance shows up. So he's dejected and he's walking down up the canyon and he gives a little hop step that everything's gonna be okay. And then the film closes in around him. Uh, SNA, which was for George Spohr and Bronco Billy Anderson, uh, they came out to Niles, Bronco Billy did to film Westerns uh, because they had been in Chicago f starting in 1907. And it's kind of hard to film with the film speed in those days with no sunlight in the winter. So uh, Bronco Billy, he was in the, he played three roles in the second movie that had a plot, which was The Great Train Robbery. And we do show that uh, every year. Uh, in fact, we just would have showed it uh, the end of July when we have our Bronco Billy Day. So we're hoping to open uh, probably early next year after we get uh, more money so we can do the restoration. So come on and visit us. Okay. <coughs> the first men in the moon in 1901 by 
H.G. Uh, Wells. Uh, this book is considered the first science fiction work. Uh, in this case, he has two adventurers who fly to the moon in a sphere using anti-gravity material that they have created called Cororite. Uh, businessman uh, Mr. Bedford narrates the story and Mr. Cavour is the eccentric inventor who invents this uh, uh, anti-gravity material. And the problem is um, there's a lot of funny stuff in it. One is that when they first invent the stuff, his uh, uh, lab workers are not paying attention and it explodes. And what it causes is everything above it to, be ca to lose its gravity and it blows off the roof and destroys things in the neighborhood. So they use it, uh, they control it by opening and closing window shades on this sphere that they use. It's glass covered with metal and that's how they control their flight. Um, and so this anti-gravity material carries them to the moon. And when they get on the moon, they discover that the inhabitants are insect-like creatures that live under the ground. And again, you have S-E-L-E-N, seleni, but now selenite. Uh, the moon bugs capture the men, uh, but uh, they are able to escape. Bedford returns to Earth, but he, he, Carver, he takes off before Carver can get on board. And somehow they're able to communicate by radio. Now it doesn't explain how Carver gets a radio. Um, but anyway, he's never allowed to return. One of the funny things in the book is when they first land and they open up the hatch, uh, which they call the manhole, uh, the air inside the capsule escapes into the thinner atmosphere, the moon, which they think at first uh, is snow. And because Bedford starts getting this terrible headache and such, Carver offers him a sip of brandy. Like that's the, the cure. <laughs> have some, here, have some brandy. So anyway, so they wander around the moon. Uh, and he does, he gets a lot of things pretty well correct um, about the, the moon. Although plants grow exceedingly fast and these guys are lost in a jungle of moon plants. So here's another trip. This is actually a trip to Polaris. Uh, from 1924 called uh, a trip to Paris or 264 trillion miles in an aeroplane. So as you notice that they're flying in an open cockpit, he's taking his students in an open cockpit plane up to Polaris. But they do make a stop at the moon. Now this is a really crazy one. This is by the, uh, uh, the chorus, the Cellular Cosmogony they thought that we actually live on the inside of a sphere. And if you notice here, there's South Africa, there's the United States and Cuba, and on the other side is Africa. And in the middle is the moon, 400 miles away. Um, and the stars are reflections from the sun, and you have the uh, moon and such. Um, they're in, uh, you can still visit them in Estero, Florida. Uh, and I have a book with this drawing in it. To me, one of the things that's funny about Astero, and I'm not trying to get political, but last year, uh, the last year or the year before, Trump held a rally there in Astero, and I just thought that was appropriate. Because they're all, <laughs> all crazy. They're, they even built a contraption to prove that the earth curves up <laughs> instead of down. They built it out at the, the shore there in Florida. Uh, there's uh, photographs in this book showing this device, trying to prove that the earth curves up and not down. Um, so this is not so much a travel log, but it's a travel guide by Abe Theophil Maru uh, in 1913. So if you're gonna travel to the moon, you better have this book with you because it shows you uh, how, how to, you know, to look for things on the moon. Problem is, Mountain peaks on the moon are not pointed cones. Um, how they get this idea? If you take a sphere, take a ball, and shine a flashlight on from one side, what kind of shadow are you going to get? You get a cone shape. So they thought that all the mountains had to have been cone shaped to get the shadows that are visible <laughs> uh, when you're looking through your telescope. 
and this is the earth up above and the Milky Way and stars. So this is by a Frenchman. Uh, to take, so you take this book with you. All right, now I have a whole bunch of the slide, the viewer slides. Um, this is a set of 12, but I only show the, the last two. Uh, these are little eight little mermaids flying land on the moon. These are the last two cards, stereo cards of the 12 for a series for the little folks. Uh, these are porcelain dolls with feather-like wings and down here, right here, you can see my cursor, is a 49er, uh, you know, prospector. And uh, he's the man in the moon. Now on the back of the cards, there's a uh, in information about them and how they fly. It's a, it's a poem. Uh, so this is from 1895 uh, by the French stereo publishers of Lawrence, Kansas. So this is a little flight <laughs> to the moon. Well, let's get real. This is the postage stamps in 1969 in honor of the first man on the moon. And up here, this looks like a scribble. That's Neil Armstrong's signature. Um, when I was selling real estate, uh, about the, the 71, 72, there was a home in San Leandro where they had this large painting of this. Uh, must have been uh, four or five feet across. And down by his foot, the astronaut's foot, was an Oli, crushed Oli beer can. Uh, <laughs> I don't even know if Oli's even still around. <laughs> but that was, that was a popular beer in those days. Okay, uh, I'm gonna get off a little bit from the travel um, to the moon. This is an advertising for blue moon silk stockings from the 1920s. And you see her, uh, she's sitting on a crescent moon with her socks, her stockings, pretty blonde and looks like wings like she's a fairy. Maybe it is, maybe it's just part of her, her skirt. All right, this is, uh, at the Galileo Museum in Florence. If any of you have a chance to go to Florence, be sure and go to the Galileo Museum. It used to be the Italian Instrument Museum. It's not just Galileo, but there's a room for him. And this is his bust holding a, a telescope in his hand. And of course, you know who. Um, there's Galileo's last message to the Pope. When he died, in 1642, the same year that Isaac Newton was born, they buried him in a back room at Santa Croce Basilica, which is only a few blocks from this building near the Uffizi Museum right along the river. And, you know, because he was persona non grata is why they stuck him in a back room. In the main sanctuary is people like Dante, Michelangelo, uh, Machiavelli, all these uh, famous Renaissance uh, people from uh, you know, the Italian Renaissance. Well, when his body was moved into the main sanctuary, some of his bones were taken. In this case, in this glass case, is the right middle finger down to the palm. And you can still see that there's some of the uh, sinew material and such. And down in the bottom, uh, kind of behind the bones is a tooth. So they stole his uh, right middle finger uh, and some other bones are all finally back together again, but they're in the museum and not with his body in the church. And the reason this is the last message to the Pope is like I say, it's the right middle finger. I, it shouldn't be too hard to figure out what that one's all about, okay? I usually get a bunch of giggles, but I get, oh, most of you are muted except Ken. Okay. Uh, if, I, if I may uh, uh, interrupt just a moment, I just have, have a quick question. Sure. Uh, you know, by the 19th century and the early 20th, certainly the physical characteristics of the moon and its orbit uh, were well known. Uh, and uh, yet the uh, stories uh, seem to uh, uh, contain a lot of, uh, uh, artistic license, so to speak, uh, about uh, the uh, the 
characteristics of the moon uh, as expressed in the stories and not being consistent with uh, what undoubtedly was known about the moon and its orbit uh, at that time. Well, there was still a lot of controversies, such as the volcanic uh, versus impact theory. It wasn't until Eugene Shoemaker around 1960, when he studied the uh, nuclear explosions in the Nevada desert, and then Meteor Crater, uh, that he realized that something had impacted the Earth roughly 50,000 years ago, uh, because it was very similar to what he found in the nuclear test sites. Uh, in 94, I was invited to an astronomy conference at Lowell Observatory because of my uh, Cambridge published my book and Cambridge had a booth there and they asked me to come. And I got a lecture along with a bunch of other people on the rim of Meteor Crater by the one and only Gene Shoemaker. And what he had discovered was when this material blew out onto the surrounding plains, and you can see some ripple rings off to the, to the west, um, was the dirt was in the same order as when it was in the crater. Uh, because, uh, you know, like when you go to the Grand Canyon, there's all the different colored stone. Uh, and so he discovered that when he did drillings outside, that obviously the layers, the, the top layer, which blew out first, was now the bottom layer uh, of, the, of the dirt outside. And so that pretty much proved that impacts could form craters like that. Now, somebody keeps posting a picture of Meteor Crater and say, damn, this uh, asteroid came, came so close, right, real close to the visitor center, missed the visitor center. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, what's interesting, but, but the, what I'm saying is that, uh, you know, you mentioned that uh, one of the stories uh, that you no, no, quoted, just a second. Uh, one of the stories that you quoted uh, said that uh, the writer speculated that the moon was actually fairly close and, uh, and, uh, and people could actually, um, you know, reach up to it. Yes. Uh, but by that time, uh, you know, the orb, the size of the orbit of the moon must have been known. Well, and, um, yeah, Ar was it Archimedes? Um, I may be, may be wrong there, just saying. Uh, tried to come up with a calculation uh, based on the right angles of the sun and the moon and, and such, but he was off. The, yeah, the, the Greeks thought, like I said, if you go to the far north, uh, because, yeah, the moon appeared to just pass slightly over the mountains, that you could reach up and grab the moon, and they had no that much of idea and perspective and such. <clears throat> the moon and the sun appear about the same size because the sun is 400 times larger than the moon, and it's 400 times farther away. So they both appear in the sky to cover about a half a degree. They also thought that uh, that everything was connected by the ether, and that you could breathe. The ether. Uh, there's another story where the the uh, adventurers hold sponges over their mouths uh, so they could breathe. Uh, now most people don't read volume two of Don Quixote, but there's a tale uh, where one of the characters flies from Madrid to Rome, and on the way he reaches up and touches the moon, and I, when he comes back to Madrid, he's actually captured, this is based on a real person, and I forget his name right offhand, uh, is tried by the Inquisition uh, because of what he's telling about, oh, I touched the moon and such. So they, had, they didn't have as much concept. And like I said, the controversy over impact versus craters was only really firmly established as being caused by uh, impacts, although there are volcanoes on the moon, and that's been firmly established, but no volcano would form a 65 mile wide caldera like Copernicus. Although hopefully not in our lifetime, uh, there is activity now under Yellowstone. They've had swarms of um, earthquakes 
in the last few months. And Yellowstone is a giant caldera. And that's why we have all the uh, um, geysers and hot springs and mud pots. Um, yeah, but, uh, but, uh, but the point I'm trying to make is that uh, the stories in the 19th and early 20th centuries mm -hmm. seem to have less concern over uh, the uh, scientific accuracy of their stories versus say, for example, a modern scientific movie, science fiction movie made nowadays would be uh, uh, poured over by uh, science nerds to uh, yeah. see how accurately reflective of a uh, uh, real known science uh, as we the, know it today. Okay. How did the Millennium Falcon fly five times faster than the speed of light? <laughs> yeah, right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and that's only 40 plus years ago, Ken. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so but, these, uh, <laughs> yeah, but, so uh, are, yeah, let me go. Yeah, but uh, but there but there are but but the uh, authors from that time seem to take much more uh, artistic license. Yeah, uh, well, than uh, compared to now even. Yep. So this is the uh, uh, watercolors that Galileo made uh, of the moon and published in Sidereus Nuncius in 1610. Uh, and the church leaders and others they didn't believe. They thought the moon was a perfect sphere because God doesn't make anything except something perfect. And uh, so that was their, their thinking. <clears throat> and it sort of got him in trouble, but not until this book came out in 1632, um, <clears throat> the dialogue concerning the two chief world systems. This is what got him in trouble with the uh, Inquisition. And it was only his friendship with the Pope who had been Cardinal Bartholomew something or other um that saved Galileo okay but he did wind up in house arrest and went blind looking at the sun uh in those days and uh so he spent the last 10 years and notice this is by Still, uh, Stillman Drake who was at UC Berkeley for a number of years and the foreword is by Einstein all right this is in Santa Croce and sorry it's a little out of focus I was hand holding the camera. You're not allowed to use tripods. Uh, but this is the sarcophagus that Galileo was moved into. He's holding a sphere and a telescope. Now what's interesting, this was probably somebody else's monument originally. Notice the outline for the fresco does not fit his monument. <laughs> so they probably were gonna bury somebody else there and, just never got around to finishing the artwork. Again, I understand the uh, I understand that his daughter is also buried in that sarcophagus as well. That, that could be. Uh, yeah, she was a church woman. Okay, in uh, uh, sixteen fifty one, uh, Giovanni Battista Riccioli published a, a map written uh, drawn by his friend Grimaldi. Uh, in which he placed the names and most of the names that he placed are still in place. Uh, but this map was the first one to show what we now call the libration zones. And here's Mari Crisium, and I mentioned Mari Imbrium, which is up here. Uh, you have Copernicus and Galileo was what's now uh, Reiner Gamma. Uh, and he says in his book that he put Kepler, which is out here, and Galileo, which is down in here, that he flung them out into the ocean where their theories would drown. <laughs> but I think, why did he name the, one of the most prominent craters uh, after Copernicus with his um, you know, heliocentric theory that we go around the moon, I mean, go around the sun? I think and uh, Ewan Whitaker, who helped me with the book, Ewan was probably one of the best authorities in the moon in the last uh, century or so, is that even though he was a, uh, Riccioli was a Jesuit, uh, and his book, uh, The uh, New Amalgist, uh, he has 77 arguments against the heliocentric theory. I think in real life, he probably thought that Copernicus Kepler and Galileo were right. Uh, but remember when he wrote his book, Galileo had just died, you know, nine years earlier. 
And so there was still a lot of negatives about Galileo and the church in those days. Um, otherwise, why would he put two of the three most prominent uh, astronomers of his time period uh, in such prominent places on the moon? So, uh, oops, I keep forgetting here. Now, <clears throat> if you want to get the most current maps of the moon with nomenclature on it, go to the USGS, uh, that's the US Geological Survey, the Flagstaff the IOU nomenclature page uh, at their website, and it's uh, uh, planetarynames.wr.usgs.gov. Now, these are maps created originally for the Apollo program, but they never created the far side nor the limb with the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter and their digital maps uh, that they put together. So they knew have all 144 that were originally planned. And in the center, uh, it's a little slightly lighter color. It's hard to say in this, in this uh, slide are the near side and the far side and the two polar regions are off to the sides. You can download these for free. They have all the names. They have a little yellow dot showing you the center of the crater or the feature. Uh, all the names are those that are official in the IAU, the International Astronomical Union. Uh, so all these oddball names that you've come across uh, are not included. Okay? So the original maps that were like this were based on artistic drawings based on the lunar orbiter maps. Those are no longer available on the USGS site. They, they've been replaced by the electronic version. You can download them, uh, take them into Photoshop, convert them to uh, PDFs, which I did. And then you can expand them and make them larger, smaller, crop them if you want to just have you know, one section to take out to the telescope, things like that. Uh, but they are the most accurate map. And you can uh, glide in, you know, make your view closer and closer. You can actually see like the rover tracks. You can see the, uh, uh, the descent stage for the LEM. Uh, you can see where they, the footprints, you can't see the individual footprints, but you see the, the trail, the disturbed soil and the instruments that they planted. Um, now, based on the LRO images, the Russians were able to find uh, one of their Lunas and they named the features that their rover actually went to. And that I cover in the book. Okay, so here's the full moon, like what's coming up in a few more days. And the question I like to ask if you want to unmute is who sees the rabbit on the moon? Anybody want to? You can. You can. Yeah, I, do. I definitely do. Okay. Where do? What do you see? Well, um, on the the furthest uh, on the right hand side on the the, the dark uh, mare the sea, uh, which I I'm thinking is mare Chrysium, but I'm not sure. That's correct. That's correct. Uh, that looks like the tail, the the bob the tail. Yep. And then the the three seas right next to it, which are um, the Sea of Fruitfulness, the Sea of Tranquility, and the Sea of Serenity, they make up sort of the hind legs. And then you have, you know, followed to the left by the body, and then the 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 front legs were at the bottom. Um, and uh, yeah, it looks like a bunny leaping. Okay, <laughs> I bring this up because there's a drawing of it. You got it right, Mari Crucium. And the ears, the ears are Mari Imbrium. And the eye is um, Kepler, the you know, greater Kepler. Down at the bottom, the bright crater with a ring around it, down here, is Tycho, which is a dark halo crater, but you, you have to have the right lighting to see that. OK, well, I bring this up because many ancient societies thought that there was a rabbit on the moon. And this was, was it. Now, in July of 1054, um, there may have been a supernova 
that was visible on Earth on, in, on July that we now know as the Crab Nebula. Now, in the south, this was recorded in the Asian records. They were very attuned to watching the sky. But the Membrays Indian in the southwest lived in an area from 1050 to 1100. These pots, these two pots, uh, were discovered in the 1930s in an area that was abandoned in 1100 or so. And Dr. Robert Robbins in the uh, University of Texas, his students counted every little zigzag line, whatever. And the only thing they found with 23 was this object with 23 rays. Now, the, Jap the Chinese records indicate that the supernova was visible in the sky for 23 days in the daylight. Interesting that there are 23 rays on this and that it was very close to the uh, limb of the moon. And so the, the membranes considered that the rabbit in the moon, just like what I showed you a little bit ago. And what I like is the eagle eating the rabbit and what they think is that this shows the phases. So probably in another few days, there wouldn't be much of a rabbit left. <laughs> So this, these potteries are, uh, you know, 600 years, uh, not 600, uh, you know, 400 years old or so. Now, last summer in September, my wife and I were on a trip to China with some friends and we visited Lasha in Tibet. This is inside the lobby of the Continental Hotel. The architecture is very similar to the Portola Palace, which is where the Dalai Lama would normally reside. But what this shows is the moon was south up. Uh, you see the, what's called the Gibson girl reading a book. She has a book here. Here's her head. Mari Chrysium is her pillow. You have her bodice and her uh, dress and such. And it's their midwinter festival and there's the, the rabbit in the moon. Now, in the Chinese culture, there is a rabbit pounding in the moon and that a young couple, if they want to get married, have to get the rabbit's permission. And then they are, uh, when they get married, they have a red ribbon uh, holding their hands, tied to their hands. But this is an incredible uh, lobby. In the hotel, they even had a little button on the wall where you could get oxygen uh, blown into your uh, room and they had humidifiers in the room. Now, one of the things that we learned is the Chinese don't drink cold liquids very much. And so in each of the room, the, the, the bedrooms that we had, we were gone for 19 days. In all of the hotel rooms, they had a refrigerator, but none of them were plugged in. You had to plug them in and then, then you could refrigerate your, uh, your cold drink. Okay. Now, in 1903, William Henry Pickering, uh, in his book, which was the first photo album of the moon, he had people draw what they thought they saw in the moon. And you have the man in the moon. Uh, you have the girl reading, which I showed you, and the lovers. Now, in this case, it's a lady in the moon. In this case, it would be the man, uh, the lover in the moon. You have the donkey and the crab. A uh, little, little play on the, the donkey instead of, a, instead of a, a rabbit. Okay, there so you can see the lady in the moon with, with south up and here's Tycho way up here. Okay. So this is from 1907. It's the uh, front of the uh, cover from a book by a man named Mueller. Uh, there's the man and the man and the woman, his lover behind him here. And this one is, it's kind of hard to see, but it's like a donkey or a jackass. And says, is this a nightmare, M-A-R-E? And here you see the uh, five nights before full moon, how the woman in the moon starts appearing here. And then on the full moon, more like this. It's very noticeable, of 
closer to full moon to see that. Okay, this is uh, the, the moon is for lovers. Notice the shape of the moon. And this is the glitter path down here when the, the moon or even Venus when it's bright will shine across the water. This is from Harper's Weekly, November 1907. Now I like these old postcards. Uh, I have a collection of them where you have lovers with the moon in it, uh, stage postcards uh, from France in uh, circa 1930s, Germany 1910 with the smiling moon behind in the little car. This is a French postcard, another one from 1930 with the moon in the back. And here's a full moon and from Austria, 1900. And this is my last uh, card. Uh, so after my talk and you go back to your bathroom, be sure and brush your teeth with Zahn Weiss, a cream for tea. This is Johnson & Johnson, 1887. So I'll entertain any, uh, any questions? That was my my last slide. Uh, you guys can unmute uh, and uh, ask me questions if you'd like. Let me. Uh, I'll stop sharing. Anybody got any questions? So your book. Uh, well, I haven't seen your book. Uh, so for those of us who have not seen your book. Uh, obviously, you have a lot of literary and artistic uh, uh, components to... Yeah, now, now you can uh, say, now you've seen it. Don't say you well, haven't seen it. I haven't looked through the contents. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, uh, maybe you can outline some of the uh, uh, material in the table of contents for us. I mean, obviously, you have a large uh, amount of material from literary and uh, artistic references, but... Uh, what about uh, scientific? Uh, uh, oh, yeah, I mean, what, what are what are the other topics that you cover uh, in the book? Then this is a uh, a drawing. I, if you guys can see it, again, it's Diana. She has a little. She's always drawn with a little crescent moon on her forehead. Uh, again, one breast showing fertility. Um, at the beginning and the end of each chapter, I have either words of wisdom or uh, some kind of poetry about the moon. Uh, and this one, I, on this page, <clears throat> I invoke you, mother of darkness. I invoke you, mother of the night. Let your angels of inspiration open my heart. Let your angels of courage fly inside. This an anonymous moon spell for courage. Uh, yes, I do talk about the earth moon system, uh, weather, uh, you know, there is a land tide, which most people don't realize. Um, as just like the water tides, the moon also affects the land. And there are periods where my double door in my bedroom will stick, and other times it doesn't stick. Uh, we have, uh, we live on a, uh, a Union City, so I'm on uh, uh, sediment and uh, the mud. I'm, my uh, elevation, according to GPS, is only nine feet. Uh, I talk about photography. We were talking about photography earlier. This is one of the earliest daguerreotypes of the moon. Uh, that's courtesy of Harvard. Uh, the man um, Samuel Dwight Humphreys uh, from New York took a series of photographs in 1849 uh, showing the different exposure. Uh, I talk about uh, film. I talk about um, uh, you know, digital, although digital is changing so rapidly, it's kind of hard to keep up. Talk about uh, uh, um, eclipses, occultations. Uh, the first part also is about uh, telescopes and instruments, because many of the men who were involved in the development of telescopes, eyepieces and such, and film have their names uh, on the moon. So I wanted to, I wanted the book to be more than just here's crater A, it's so big, it's so deep. Um, okay, let's go on to crater B. Um, oh, it's named for Joe Smith. I'm just throwing names out. And that's about it. 
And that was the style of those books that go back uh, in the 1880s and such, 1870s. And I wanted to say, this is Crater A, it's named for Joe Smith, and this is what Joe Smith did, okay? Uh, so that takes up the book. Oh, and then, and, you know, how big it is and what to look for uh, and such, and along with a lot of the satellite features. Uh, in doing all this, I wanted to make sure that I had everything as correct as possible. When I first started, the I got f uh, from the U union was able to get you and Whitaker was able to get for me the pre-published version of a nomenclature book that the USGS was going to put out because they maintain the official lunar nomenclature along with all the other planetary. Nomenclature. So if you go to that. Uh, USGS site that I told you, you can look at all of the named features in the solar system, except asteroids. They don't, uh, they're not in charge of asteroids or comets, okay? but everything else, um, Mercury, Venus, any, any feature, uh, there's some asteroids with names on them now of features, because we've been close to some and they've been able to take pictures of, of craters on the asteroids and name them and such. Um, but this, 1994 pre-publication nomenclature book, just horribly full of errors. Mm. Um, they had one guy living 125 years because they transposed. <laughs> they, they died in that he died in 1885. They, they died in 1858. They changed it to 1885. <laughs> um, there's, there's another person that lived only like the teenage years, because again, they screwed up that. Misspelled names, uh, wrong professions, wrong nationality, just all kinds of errors. I sent into the GS uh, over 900 corrections. And uh, Jennifer Blue, who was in charge at that time, uh, added a little thank you on the acknowledgement page to me for what I did. Because I wanted to make sure that what I published was correct. There's another book that came out while I was writing mine by the Cox brothers. I've got it up here somewhere um, in which they had people getting awards that they never got, giving awards to uh, individual A who actually got it by individual B. They just, they just horribly screwed up their book. And uh, so I wanted to make my book uh, more outstanding and uh, correct. Um, I did get criticized by one guy <clears throat> in star hopping. He didn't like my drawing of the Pleiades, um, said that I had that wrong. Well, if he had turned over another page, he would have seen my more detailed drawing of the Pleiades based on a photograph. And I did the drawing on a little Macintosh um, and a light box. And as I placed the stars, I would then compare them on the, the photograph on the light box. So I knew it was accurate, but he complained about the earlier drawing, which was much smaller. So I wanted to make sure that I didn't get that kind of uh, complaints. Uh, that's just pride of, of authorship. But um, the first uh, six chapters are how to observe, how to buy a telescope, how, you know, how to use, uh, you know, buy cameras and whatnot, how the earth and moon, earth sun and moon system works and those kind of, and then all of the lunar lore uh, going back. And then chapters seven through 20 are the moon each day of the lunation with the, that last chapter being from, um, uh, new, uh, from uh, full moon back to new moon because I've already talked about those features, but a lot of features look different uh, depending on whether it's in morning light or afternoon light. That means whether the moon is uh, rising in the east or passed over at full moon and then setting on the, the western side. Um, so I do talk about what, what features might look different than what to look for. Then I take you in closer and we look at rills and um, the rays. Now what I'd like to talk about in the rays there's all kinds of theories about what the rays were. Uh, one gentleman thought that they were uh, s streaks of salt left over from that the moon had an ocean. And his analogy was 
Well, they have these streaks of salt in India, which is what uh, Mahatma Gandhi took his people to to, to collect salt. Uh, others thought that it was cracks in the lunar surface. And as the sun passed over, it vaporized moisture. And so what you were seeing was the moisture, the vapor coming out. Well, it wasn't until uh, the astronauts from Apollo 11 brought back samples of lunar ray material that they confirmed what Shoemaker had speculated was just powdered material blown out from the craters, like what he saw at um, a Meteor Crater uh, in checking the soils, that it was blown out, but that it had aged in the solar rays and had been white when first uh, blown out. And as craters aged, the rays disappeared. The material was still there, but over millions of years of solar rays, and that's one reason why they put up a solar ray, uh, looks like a lampshade, a uh, window shade that Apollo 11 put up, was they wanted to see how much material would impact that sheet of aluminum, mm. plus all the other uh, experiments that they put up, the seismograph and such. And speaking of which, as I bring it up, is, you know, there's these TV shows on history, uh, ancient aliens, and you got all these ancient uh, uh, theories about how we've been visited in the past. One of them, they thought, because when the seismometers were set up and they allowed uh, like the fourth stage rockets to back into the moon so they knew exactly when it happened and, and where and so they could determine the distance. The moon rang like a bell as they say. And so these astronaut theorists say, oh see the moon is hollow. It's actually uh, a spaceship built by aliens so they're, they're watching us. <laughs> and as I about threw up, you know. <laughs> well, it's of interest that uh... Uh, I just found a, uh, I didn't see it, of course, but uh, I just found that there was a a YouTube review of this this book, actually, uh, in a video format. Uh, I don't know if you've had a chance to see it uh, yourself. My book? Yeah, your I'm... book, yeah. If you if you go to if you go to uh, YouTube and look up the title of your book, you'll find that there's a actually a uh, a, a a YouTube video review called Amazing Luna uh, Cognita, Known Moon, Robert Garfinkel book. Uh, it's an unboxing review, whatever that means. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> no, I didn't know about that. Oh, okay. Uh, All right. I did. Uh, yeah. Earlier last month, I did a, a talk on what's called Astro Radio. Okay. Uh, um, Pete Williamson, he's uh, also a FRAS, a fellow mm -hmm. with Astro Society. He does. Uh, he has a radio show. They're uh, they're not too far from uh, Wales, and at eight o'clock their time, which is twelve thirty in the morning our time, uh, I did a half hour chat with him on live radio, and that's available on their YouTube. Mm. Uh, funny thing is, like, <laughs> he's into silent movies, and we spent most of my time talking about silent movies. Charlie <laughs> Chaplin. <laughs> And then I realized when my wife listened to the re replay, she said, you didn't talk about the book. So Pete's going to let me uh, do another talk when he uh, needs to fill a night. But no, I didn't know about the YouTube. That's interesting. Yeah. But um, yeah, the um, book is, being, is well, well received, except by these five guys who only got one copy, one volume instead of all three. No. And, then, and then posted something on Amazon. And Amazon's not supposed to allow those kind of posts. They even told me, if you complain about their delivery, that's not supposed to be on it. And they, ref they have refused to uh, remove those, mm -hmm. like we've asked. Um, so yeah, the book is doing well. <clears throat> I wrote it with the, with the hope that it will last for many, many years, um, like the ones written from the 1870s and 80s uh, are still in demand. Um, what's, what's interesting is that um, uh, I have a book, I only have one volume of the two volume set by a man named um, Schroeder. Uh, I paid like about four or $500 for the one volume I have. A bookseller in his catalog had the full set for 25,000. Oh. <laughs> so 
moon books are still in demand. <laughs> and I have a set of maps that were done in 1960 by uh, Kuiper, along with uh, Ewan Whitaker and such. Uh, I paid a couple hundred dollars for them. I have two sets and they are now for $3,000. And so there's still a big demand for moon stuff. And so I hope that uh, Luna Cognita and oh, why the, why the uh, Latin name? There are thousands of books with the name, the moon, subtitle, whatever. Uh, and if you Google, or if you're on uh, Amazon or any of the other bookseller sites, and you type in something, the moon, you'll wind up with uh, the moon is down by um, Seinbeck or the moon and sixpence by mom, uh, lots of poetry and such. It's hard to find a nonfiction moon. So Latin was the language of science in Europe uh, during the Renaissance up until the 1800s when English took over and, and German. Uh, and I thought, since I talk a lot about the history of lunar theories and such, uh, and the development of things like telescopes and, and cameras and whatnot, that uh, I would, um, uh, this is how Chinese see, oh, somebody's posting something else um, in the chat. So I thought that I would use that and it makes it so the book stands out uh, from all the other, the moon, something or other. Um, she, let's see what, I'm just gonna take a look and see what this chat is. That's yeah, it. I was just sharing how um, Chinese sees the rapid pounding herbs. That was a legend. Yep. Yeah, that's what I was saying that the, the rabbit in the moon and that's the same idea that the Native Americans, uh, the Chinese, the Europeans all had in their um, uh, lunar lore, something about a rabbit. I do talk about lunar lore from throughout the world. And a lot of the American Indian lore deals with Mr. Coyote as causing some kind of trouble. And in one uh, story, uh, the coyote steals the sun and the moon that are in, in boxes. And as he's running around, he drops one of them. He drops the moon and it goes up into the sky. Um, and that's why there's others where, um, why the markings on the moon, uh, the Indians thought that the moon had been slapped with a feather. I'm not gonna tell the whole, the whole story. Just, there are all kinds of, of tales. Uh, like that. Uh, the Mayas have uh, various tales, the Aztecs. <clears throat> Some are very similar. Uh, you, you go back to Gilgamesh, uh, you know, ancient uh, Mediterranean societies all have various lunar lore. Uh, in, uh, in Africa, there's one where a, a turtle is to, cross, is to help uh, the moon across a river on its back and the turtle uh, sinks and that's and then is revived and that's to indicate you know the the life and death of the moon that it is you know visible and then it drowns and then it's rebirth uh, they used to use the term combust when the moon would go into a uh, new moon that it would be so close to the sun that it would burn up and you wouldn't see it because it was just ash and then it was re reborn <laughs> Uh, you know, the first, first uh, visible night. And so uh, there were those theories and there's a bunch of stories like that. I talk about, is it the man in the moon or the woman in the moon? Because in some lore, the moon is a woman. In other lore, we have the man in the moon. Uh, so I talk about those kind of things uh, that are also covered. So anybody else have any questions? It's uh, 8.30, so I'm, I'm, I'll stay on and entertain, you know, questions. So. Uh, I, have, I have a question, uh, this is Stuart. Sure. Um, you mentioned the um, uh, films and uh, Turner Classic Movies a few weeks ago had uh, some of the old silent films and there were a couple like Woman in the Moon 
uh, which is a German uh, silent film. Uh, I think it was by the wife of Fritz Lang or somebody like that. And of course, they're commenting, uh, whoever their narrator is, they're com commenting on the um, sort of the cinematic qualities of the film and the production. I'm wondering if you have any opinions, not about the technical ac accuracy by modern standards, but by their standards, how, how good was uh, a movie like uh, Woman on the Moon uh, in that context uh, in its own time? Well, the, the nitrate film was a very slow uh, speed film uh, in the early years of the science of the silent films. And so uh, as an example, why did SNA come out to California? SNA was for the S for Spore, the A for, for Anderson, Bronco Billy Anderson, who was the first silent film cowboy star before Tom Mix and uh, William Hart and such. And so when they were trying to film in Chicago, like I said, they started in 1907, it was rather difficult to make movies because the only light they basically had was the sun. They had some electric light, but not, not as powerful like they use today. Um, and the film speed would get real, real slow in the cold weather. And so the other thing was hand cranking movies. Uh, remember they were originally called flickers because you couldn't hand crank it with a steady film. It wasn't until the advent of talkies that they absolutely had to have a steady uh, movement of the film through the camera. Uh, so up until that time, uh, which was 19, late 20s, 28, 29, um, everything was hand cranked. Now at the museum, we have a number of antique uh, projectors and our historian and kind of titular leader, uh, David Keene, he's also our projector, a projectionist, and he has hand cranked the whole night's movies. We showed two shorts, wow. comedy shorts, uh, and then a full length feature. And now technique wise, um, really dependent on the, on the director with the lighting and, and such. Obviously everything was black and white. There was some, some color when people have used uh, three, three color um, filters and shot through the three filters. Uh, there's some double exposure type stuff. Uh, there's one where uh, we've seen showed is where uh, the matches miraculously light on their own and such and dance around. Um, you had uh, Chaplin as his own uh, you know, director and wrote his own scenarios. They didn't call them screenplays in those days, they were scenarios. Um, many of the scenarios now, SNA in Niles made about 350 films in the four years that they were there, but only about 10% of them survive. Hmm. Um, we have a bunch of them in our uh, collection. We have over 10,000 films in our archives. A um, bunch of them are original nitrates. A lot of them are uh, prints on safety film, so we can show them. The nitrate films are just too fragile to run through a projector nowadays. I mean, they're over 100 years old. Um, so we can, we have equipment where we can run them through our digital uh, machine and then reproduce them on safety film uh, and clean them up as, ne as necessary. Um, David is just really uh, incredible researcher. Um, you know, you've probably seen the film A Trip Down Market Street, which was filmed it turns out only four days before the earthquake. Hmm. Um, the National Archives thought it was filmed in September of 1905. And that's what they've been putting out for decades. Well, David didn't think that was right. In particular, there are a couple of license plates that are visible in the film. And when he was finally able to check with the state archives, because the DMV no longer has records from those days, uh, there were 1,500 California license plates at that time. <laughs> but they were not in numerical order. They were in alphabetical order by the name of the person. So David went through, and he finally found in the W's, one of the plates had been issued in January of 1906, 
and one in February of 1906. So that the film could not have been made in 1905. There was no way. So down near the ferry building, if you watch the film, the street is wet. And what David did is he went through all the newspapers uh, before the earthquake and found that it had not rained until the night of April 13, 1906. <laughs> and so the street was still wet from the rain the night before. Well, the Miles brothers, we find, find, nobody knew who had made it. They finally found uh, an ad on April 21st, 1906, talking about that they had just filmed, uh, made a movie called a trip that they were going to call a trip down Market Street, in which they had mounted a camera on a trolley. And as the trolley went down from starting around, I think like 8th or 9th Avenue, down towards the ferry building, they hand cranked it. And, and one thing, you'll see there's one car, the guy keeps going around the block and getting in front of the camera again. Um, what David wants to, there's some newspaper boys and, and the film is not clear enough that he can determine the, what the front page looks like. Because if he can blow that up enough where he doesn't lose uh, resolution, maybe he can find the day of those newspapers that the newspaper boys are trying to sell. And that would also uh, verify the date. Well, about 11 years ago or so, Morley Safer came out to our theater and interviewed David and showed the trip down Market Street. And I still get a little verklempt. When Morley died a few years ago, they, they said that he had made over 900 episodes for 60 minutes. And they wanted to show what he considered his favorite one and it was the interview of David and the trip down Market Street. So we show that um, in April. Now, a couple of years ago, they found another nine minutes of film after the earthquake showing the destruction. Well, David knows the Miles Brothers, descendants, and they, the Miles Brothers were also a photo studio. They had lost everything in the earthquake and fire. The reason the film survived is the night before the earthquake, it had been put on a train to be developed in New York. The Miles Brothers had offices in New York and California, but in California, they didn't develop film. So it was on its way to be developed in New York. That's the only reason why it survived. Um, so David took this uh, nine minutes of film that a guy in, in, had found it in a garage sale and digitized it put it on safety film so we could show it. We still have the nitrate film on loan to us permanently uh, by the owners of the film uh, for our, because we have the uh, archives that we can protect it. And uh, so we show that. Well, David went over to the Miles Brothers descendants and looked in their photo album. And there are the exact same photographs in the album, the photo album as in the film. And so that nobody knew who that who had made that film. Well, now we know it's the Miles Brothers. Um, there's a scene where they blow up the remnants of the city hall because the city hall, which was on Market Street in those days, was pretty much devastated. And in the film, you see the explosion. And in the photo album is pictures of the explosion. And he was able to pretty much show that the exact moment they took the picture is in the, is one of the frames of the film. Now, as far as your question about quality, um, as cameras got better, better lenses, better control, better lighting, uh, by around the mid teens, uh, they were able to use better lighting, electric lights, um, where before it was pretty much dependent on the sun or outdoor scenes and such. And um, so the film, like I said, the film got better, better quality, uh, better techniques by directors. Uh, even um, as late as like Martin Scorsese's uh, Raging Bull could have filmed it in color, but he chose to do it in <laughs> black and white. Orson Welles used black and white for Citizen Kane because there's a, uh, I'm, I'm not catching the word for a moment, but by using the black and white, the contrast, 
is they can control the contrast. They control the lights, you know, around the eyes in the dark, you know, so to emphasize the character's eyes, um, stuff like that. In fact, um, Elephant Man is shot in black and white, could have been filmed in color. Um, I think, didn't they do Silent Movie in, in black and white um, just a few years ago? Um, there was one by uh, uh, Mel Brooks, a uh, silent film, and the only one that talks is uh, the mime, Marcel Marceau. Uh, <laughs> has, a, has a couple lines. The rest of everything is, is uh, silent with uh, Bernadette Peters in it. But it all depends on the skill of, of the cameraman and the, and the director. When Charlie left Niles, one of the men he took with him was Raleigh Totharoff, who was as his cameraman. And Raleigh stayed with him until 1952, when Charlie w went to Europe to promote uh, his movie, uh, Lamplight. And McCarthy had accused him of being a communist and they revoked his return visa. Charlie, although he lived in the United States for about 40 years, never became a US citizen. And so he wound up eventually buying a mansion in Verve, Switzerland, which is on the shore of Lake Geneva. And we visited that uh, last summer. And they have what they call this, there's houses there. And the furnishing in the house was all of the original because his kids still owned all the furniture. They've sold the house and grounds to a company that now uh, produces it as called Chaplin's World. And uh, so they also built a studio, what they call a studio where they've uh, reproduced uh, sets from 35 of his films. And they have his two uh, Academy Awards. The third Academy Award was stolen. Uh, so Charlie was an incredible director as well as um, uh, wrote his own music all the all the, the music um i think it's modern times can only be shown uh legally with the, an orchestra uh if you're doing it in the theater now tcm shows it and such but that's uh you know the digital soundtrack but if we wanted to show it we'd have to have an orchestra uh to show it that's required by the estate hmm. um now you know his his films obviously were all in black and white he could have filmed the later films in color, but he chose uh, to use black and white on almost everything he made, although he did do some in color uh, later. Uh, Lamplight is in color and uh, The Great Dictator. So to answer your question, that's, that's, I do talk about the development of film from daguerreotypes to digital. Uh, and I showed you that page it's actually a series of daguerreotype images as to he, sh he showed how long he exposed his camera. Uh, so, um, and then it depends on the observatory. I have some pictures that were done uh, by Lick and uh, Yerkes and such. So obviously those are gonna be about the best lenses and mirrors, <laughs> you know, the professional. I tried to avoid using the professional stuff like that because the books for amateurs. Um, yes, libraries and research facilities and such will buy copies and put them in their library and such. But my goal was for amateurs. Did that uh, fill you in? Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. But uh, like I said, we're restoring the theater. It was built in 1913 as a Nickelodeon. And then after uh, 1923, when they built the theater next door, which unfortunately it burned down in the late fifties. So it's just a parking lot. Luckily it didn't take our building with it. Um, when we took over the building in, in 2005, pulled off some sheetrock and found the original projection booth with the tin on the floor, the walls and the ceiling uh, <laughs> because the old nitrate films would catch fire. Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> nitrate, nitroglycerin. Sure, right. You know, nitro that blew up half of uh, uh, Beirut. <laughs> uh, so silver nitrate is uh, it can be a problem. And if it's not stored properly and is uh, left into the air, 
uh, it, it turns into like vinegar. It smells like vinegar and becomes just a, a gummy mess. And we have a bunch of those cans um, where we can't really do much with it other than say, yeah, we have, you know, this antique film that nobody else has a copy of because we have the one copy, but no one can show it because it's just garbage because it wasn't stored properly, hmm. which, which reminds me in Dawson, Yukon territory, they had the theaters up there and films would get sent up to them and it would cost them more to send it back. So the film company said, well, just dispose it. Well, there's a film of them throwing reels and reels of these silent films into the Yukon River. Ugh. But there was a, uh, uh, a swimming pool. And when they um, wanted to get rid of all these films they, and they didn't need the swimming pool anymore, they threw it was 530 something reels of discarded film that they threw into the hole for the swimming pool and then buried it. Well, the permafrost protected the film. But when, they, <laughs> when they wanted to build another building about 30 years ago, it's in sight, they're digging up for the foundation and they're coming across all these reels of film. They're all nitrate <laughs> films. There were uh, a bunch of them are SNA films and we now have copies of them. But when they wanted to ship them to the, Nation, the Canadian National Archives, um, the commercial airlines wouldn't take it. And so what they did is they got the military to take it because this stuff is dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> it's a so, so they took it to the, National, the Canadian National Archives, who then made uh, safety film copies and gave copies to the American National Archives. So these 530 something films were saved and almost all of them are in perfect condition. Wow. Uh, unfortunately, they threw all these other ones in the river. <laughs> which would become nothing now because the water would have washed away the emulsion. Hmm. Uh, and then they're probably scattered for hundreds of miles down the river, uh, which is unfortunate. But luckily, 500 got saved and a lot of them were the only copy known of a film. And recently we did get a film David was able to secure that was the only, it's the only known copy of a film. In fact, the film was listed as being lost uh, the National Archives has a list of thousands of films that are considered lost. Yet there may be a copy somewhere that will be discovered. Um, we did get one from the Midwest though, about four or five years ago. Somebody called us up and said, hey, you know, we're cleaning out Papa's garage and you know, his basement. And we found this old movie projector and there's a roll of film in it. And uh, it was an old antique projector. David went out to see it. And it was an SNA film still in the projector. <laughs> it had been there like <laughs> 90 something years or whatever in Papa's basement. So we now have the film and the camera, I mean, and the projector. Uh, and so it's now, you know, in our safety uh, archives protected. But what's amazing is it survived out of the can all those years down in the, probably in the damp cool basement protected it so and it's in good it's in pretty good shape we do have some that are just you know totally wiped out pretty much uh because they were not stored properly but uh yeah there's a uh, your your book uh, going back to your book um it sounds like it's rather 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 more of an encyclopedia of uh, every every of everything that's uh, ever been said about the moon. Is there a listing in there of uh, all of the known um, atlases of the moon going back well, to that, the well, beginning? Well, that would be pretty much in the bibliography. The bibliography is almost 90 pages. Okay. All right. um, I do, one of the things I started doing was all of the flights to the moon, real flights, uh, okay. going back to the first. And there was no single source for that when I first started. Now there's, hmm. you know, the internet is just loaded with it. Right. Um, what, but after the fall of the Soviet Union, there was a book by about Korolev. Hang on a second. I had it right here on top. Uh, let me hold it up so you can see. 
see the name on it? Yeah. Okay. Okay. He was the chief rocket scientist for the Soviets. And after the fall, they were able to dig through all the archives of, the, of their space program and come up with um, all of their moon flight, attempted flights. A, a lot of their rocket blew up seconds after liftoff. They had a lot of trouble with the uh, N1 uh, rocket. Um, so I was able to create the first list that I knew of, of all of the flights, hmm. um, including uh, Apollo and such. Uh, I didn't include Gemini or Mercury because those were not intended to go to the moon, but all of the other flights, Soviet and now, you know, I list the pending flights. There are a bunch of flights that were planned and never, never created. Uh, I list that type of stuff in there, mention that it was never funded, never created, such, but planned. Um, and so that list is new. Um, uh, Hugh Percy Wilkins with his 300 inch map, which is almost a joke because he added non-existent features. The lines, <laughs> the lines that you would call uh, latitude and longitude in the orthographic system they're just uh, the radii points. Uh, the lines don't match up from sheet to sheet, uh, which throws it off. Normally in a moon map, what they'll do is for the satellite features, you have the main feature name and the satellite features around it. And they will put on the outside of the satellite feature, the alphabet, the ABC, pointing towards the main feature. Well, Wilkins put the satellite designator inside the crater. So you don't know which crater this is a satellite of. Made it very difficult. Well, he produced a list of new names uh, where he named features and gave uh, the coordinates, but the coordinates are all off, a lot of them. Uh, the names, uh, he misspelled names, put the wrong initials in wrong life dates, all this stuff. So I was able to straighten all that out uh, with the help of some British friends. And this, that appears in the book. Uh, well, he's got on the names on the map, but he, but it appears in his uh, really moon books movie, from 1955 sure. with Wilkins and Moore. And so I wrote to uh, uh, Patrick Moore, because I know nothing about that. That was all Wilkins stuff. <laughs> you know. Um, I wrote to I wrote to Moore on several occasions, and he would always write back on the back of my of the piece of paper that I'd sent him, my message to him. Um, he didn't have a computer. He didn't use a computer. He used a 1908 Woodstock typewriter. So I was never able to send him by email. And um, Harold Hill, who did his portfolio of lunar drawings, um, when I would write to him. He also used the old manual typewriter. Remember the old manual typewriter? You can get a red and, and black ribbon, red on the top and black on the bottom. Yeah. Well, his, his letters back to me would be half the character in red and half the character in black. His, <laughs> obviously his old, his old typewriter was out of alignment. But he gave me 25 of his drawings that had never been published before. And they're in the book. I talk about how to draw the moon. I have several guys who wrote their techniques, what they use. And one gentleman is a man named Peter Grego. Peter died about five years ago, but I still get email with his name. And obviously it's, you know, spam because it's not uh, actually his name, uh, you know, his address, what it was, but his name will be on the, uh, from, yep. so um, yeah. So the book covers a lot of material and I am, uh, working on a second edition where, where I'm adding more material to it. And yes, I am considering doing a fourth volume of The Far Side. Uh, like I told my wife, I've been working on the book for 30 years. I don't know if I have another 10 years to put in a fourth volume. Uh, but, but we may, I'm still, still giving it a lot of consideration uh, of doing it. So the book would be more, more complete. Uh, well, the longer you wait, the less time you have. <laughs> well, yeah, the book was only published in March of this year. So, 
So, but I am already finding stuff that I didn't have. But uh, any other questions? I mean, I'm, I can stay longer. I have no problem. Like I can say I'm not going anywhere. Somebody answering your question or is that someone just in the background? Well, if there are no more questions, um, thank you for asking me to uh, give a presentation. Uh, thank you, Robert. It was great. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So uh, are we prepared to spend a few minutes uh, doing Star Party? Does that sound all right to you? Uh, let's see, Ed, you're still on. Uh, yeah. Uh, I got uh, M2 kind of in, in scope live at the moment. Uh, okay. Well, um, let's see. Let's see if I have, can pull up my narration here. What's the sky like outside? Uh, it ah. seems clear. Um, okay. I, Clearish. It, it look, yeah, it looked a little hazy to me. It, my wife says she can see some, some stars and uh, Jupiter. It's okay. You definitely can see Jupiter. It's it's a little, as you can see, it's kind of uh, great because I'm kind of green and light polluted. Um, but uh, so, what is this we're looking at? This is M two globular cluster. M two. Right. Gee, I don't know if I have a write up on that. This is actually live, so it's not from my static images. Yeah. I've got okay. the ring live. So um, I've got a little bit on M2. So it's a, it's a globular cluster in the region of our galaxy where hundreds of thousands of stars form about the same time. It's uh, located about 55,000 light years away uh, and has a diameter of 150 light years or 12 arc minutes. Um, it's known to be one of the largest and most dense globular clusters. It's very old, 13 billion years old. So therefore it's uh, formed about the, as, as long, uh, as old as the galaxy, close. Uh, it contains about 150,000 stars, uh, which is um, uh, almost visible with the naked eye. It's a magnitude of 6.3. Oh, there's the ring, yeah. Yeah, nice okay. thing about your nice thing about your rendering of the ring is it's colorful. Yeah. Yeah, we're picking up a see. little bit of. Have you, uh, Michael? Uh, have you noticed uh, any predominant colors in those globulars? They look a little yellowish or something else. Not exactly. I think I most. I, I, um, I haven't quite let it run for a really long time taking pictures and stacking to see what I what I get it's mostly mostly I'm just getting um, you know white light yeah 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 very nice Ed mm -hmm. okay there's only, there's only one ring up there because nobody smokes anymore yeah yeah that must be the problem cigars <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to go back to the actual. Most of our smoke is coming from uh, other sources nowadays. Amen. Yeah, yeah. It, it doesn't blow smoke rings. Uh -huh. Okay, Michael, you got something else? 14, something like that. So I was going to show the uh, Western Vale oh. Nebula. Oh, neat. Ah. Or I... Eastern, sorry, that's the Eastern Vale Nebula. So uh, it seems to be a the the, the veil nebula seems to you know take over a large part of the sky and this is just one little tiny chunk of it. Yeah, I think the, there's something like seven separate NGC objects in that one one uh, nebula. Yeah. Nebula for a star swarm. Yeah. Also, all those gaseous clouds, all the particles are coming together. Stars. So I was trying to get. Um, um, the another uh, you know just the dumbbell, but it's definitely not good enough skies for it. And the, this is the uh, I believe the Western Veil. Yep. So you can see it's at the tip of the long tendril. Uh, Mike, I have a I just have a question. Um, 
when you got your telescope and started it, uh, got it uh, going, uh, did you uh, did you uh, collimate the the main mirror according to the instructions? I, I I did the tests to see if I needed to. Okay. Um, and it seemed good. Um, I yeah. it I certainly um, uh, focus it very uh, you know often many times when I use it. Uh, that does seem to change a bunch. Okay. Um, that's pretty easy to do with the little fixer they have there. Um, but yeah, that's I hadn't I hadn't really had to do do too much to it right off the bat. So yeah, this, it, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say this image we're looking at uh, the bright star is that Deneb or something else? I think so. Yeah. Okay. Sorry to interrupt. Oh, the, well, the question I had about the uh, uh, collimation is, uh, the, according to the in, according to the instruction manual, you're supposed to uh, center the uh, shadow of uh, the uh, of the, the chip holder at the top of the scope uh, yeah. in the image. And uh, I don't know if uh, you folks have uh, uh, worked with that. Yeah, I mean, I like I said, I did test it first, try it out, and and you know found a bright star like like the dab, and and you, it'll end up just putting a cross right in the middle of it if it's right. perfectly you, centered. Um, okay. You have to, okay. You know, take okay. the focus all the way um, uh, to the to the I guess it's the right. Can't quite remember. Um, you know, the one side so that yeah, uh, the uh, the focusing wheel. Yep. It's, a, it's defocused just, all to the right, right? Yep, you'll get an X in the middle of it, and unless it's out of alignment, then it'll be a little up or a little to the left or whatever. Okay, all Mine right. Mine was that's... good, so I didn't have to. I I didn't have any problem. Okay. Yeah, I I had the same thing. I've checked it once or twice, but I haven't had any need to do it. Okay. Now, the problem is to check I it. You got to throw your focus way out. Yeah, and I use the focuser a lot. The the little crosshair. Hmm. Um, yeah, thing I use that a ton. Yeah, the button off mask. Yep, and uh, you're supposed it, yeah. to take black reference frames almost every use. Another one that I've been uh, interested Jupiter, in trying to get. Was... I tried to get it from my backyard, and I did, but it wasn't as good as this. And this is the uh, the crescent nebula. Mike, since uh, this team has already seen those pictures, I'm not sure it makes sense for me to show them again. Okay. 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 Well, I guess trail in it. <laughs> what that was about is that uh, Hanan has uh, stored images of Jupiter and Saturn, but uh, the sky apparently doesn't lend itself to live ones right now. But uh, now the sky is pretty bad. Yeah, I can't get the dumbbell in. I just get little fuzz. It's uh, uh, not a very. It's an unclear fuzzball. But um, mm -hmm. I uh, see. I also captured, I think it's this one that I've been trying to get. Let me double check. Yeah, this was the Wizard Nebula. And I can't get this one from my house, but I could get it like from a dark sky. Where, uh, what constellation is the Wizard Nebula in? I would have to look that up. I don't remember now. I know there's something called the the Witch Nebula, which is a uh, actually a reflection nebula uh, near Rigel in uh, Orion, but that's not what this is. No, nah, no, nah, th this was discovered by Herschel. Mm -hmm. um, uh, actually, his 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 uh, sister, Caroline Herschel, discovered it, um, and it's in the constellation of. Uh, uh, Cepheus. Okay. Uh, and certainly, uh, like the Hubble versions of this are, are, are quite quite a bit more spectacular. But uh, yeah. Sorry, which which constellation? This uh, is Cepheus. The, yeah. Cepheus. Oh, Cepheus. Okay. Okay, I've got right now. Hopefully, the white rose cluster, which is kind of pretty. So I'm going to pull that up. Uh, the 
white rose cluster. Boy, this one I haven't heard of. Yeah, it's um... actually that was uh, uh, suggested in one of the uh, email uh, newsletters uh, sent from Unisteller. Yeah, that, you should be able to say it. Yeah, that looks pretty good. That That's cool. neat. Yeah, and uh, you can see it. Well, some Cassiopeia, so it's. Bit, yeah. I can see clouds forming up there. And it was, yeah, it's called the white rose because it looks like a rose if you're looking down on it. Yeah, yeah it looks nice. Um, this is the penguin, pen, pelican, sorry, pelican nebula. Um, and uh, it's, I think, near the Great American Nebula, or that's part of this. Yeah, it's near the uh, it's near the North American nebula. North American nebula, yeah. Right. Where we see things. So that was another one I couldn't get unless I was in dark sky area. So uh, what what are we looking at? What is this grid of uh, objects? Uh, oh, that... uh, that's that's all the different stuff I'd shot over <laughs> oh, over, over the weekend. Well, sure. opposite. Mm -hmm. So that's that's all the different ones I have, and and I I actually composited two images together. Of Andromeda, so I could get um, M31 and M32 sort of in the same shot. But what I thought was cool about the dark sky is I could actually start to get some of the um, um, the dust cloud of Andromeda uh, with the telescope. Yeah, this is kind of an interesting one, at least to me, because I said I've been getting into really globular clusters, and this is a very small, uh, distant globular. I think it's distant globular cluster. Uh, NGC uh, 66229. Globular cluster, is he related to general cluster? Oh. Yeah. His fat brother. <laughs> Place removed. Well, that's hard to resolve any stars in, huh? Yeah, it's really tiny. Um, it, yeah, I think it's kind of far away, uh, if I remember right, when I was looking about it. Uh, anyway, those are some of my, my, um, my uh, you know, some of my, my good ones. The globular clusters probably aren't as exciting, but I took a bunch of different globular clusters. Yep, this is a live at Jupiter. Uh, it's about the best I can do. Yeah. With DB scope. The means of Jupiter, yes. Yeah. Mm, that's pretty cool. It can't say any detail on the planet. And I fiddled with it, and I really can't do much better than that. Uh, it looks like two of the moons are really close to each other. Mm-hmm. One thing you've got to make sure you do uh, EV scope, guys is stop, make sure you put your uh, gain and uh, exposure back up before you go try to slow someplace. Oh, otherwise you won't see it. <laughs> otherwise, otherwise it won't find it. Yeah, that's right. And I've, I've had that problem a few times. <clears throat> Got a light over there. Oh, there he is. There it is, yeah. Ah, you're as good as I want them. Okay. Let's see, you're going to reduce the gain in exposure again. I'm going to reduce the gain. They suggested reducing the gain a lot. Yeah, there we go. You can see the rings. Very small. Well, you, you could for a second. Yeah. You can just make them out there. Maybe I take the exposure down a little. Oh, there we go. Okay. Hey, look at that. Not bad. For a little yeah. scope. Yeah. Yeah, you can almost see the uh, Cassini division. Huh? Well, not the Cassini division, but the no, but the, the space, but the space between but the, the space rings and the planets. Yeah. Between the rings and the planet. That's right. Yeah. 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 And drop that exposure time more, see what happens. 
Yeah, I'm knocking. I'm oh, knocking there down. we go. Oh, look at that. Look at that. Oh, yeah. Look at that. Oh, wow. Yeah. How cool. Well That's good. That's yes. Good. For deep space things, mm. not close up things. Yeah, it's pretty yeah. good. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Of course, that's live. You can see it's bouncing around. <laughs> Yeah, exposure will just pull it right out. I, if you try to uh, then enhance, it'll blow it right out. Oh, wow. Look at that. Yeah. yeah. Not bad. Not bad. Yeah. Not bad at all. That's pretty good. Yeah, 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 yeah. Look neat now. Oh, wait, where are you going? Yeah. About as good as you typically get with a small amateur scope on an average night. Yeah, okay. it's not really that good of a night. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's not that good of a night to start with, and it's, uh, I suspect we could do a lot of fooling around. But it's, uh, but it's apparent what it is, that's uh, yeah, the yeah. point, yeah. 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 So that's uh, not, not just a big blob. Mm hmm It's kind of even interesting, too, because you start off as a blob, and then you slowly show what it really is. Yeah, well, that was because I was reducing uh, exposure and gain yeah. to the point where it, the camera is so sensitive that basically the planet, those two planets are way too bright for us. And uh, so I had to cut down on the, the uh, sensitivity of the camera a lot. Okay, there he is. That's A11, a.k.a. the Wild Duck Cluster. Oh, there's one. Quack. I don't see Daphne in this. Who? Daphne. I don't see any duck. Yeah. Does it look like the formation of the ducks forming? Looks more like the Wild Rice Cluster. Yeah. yeah. Like a pimple on your duck. <laughs> Which goes well with duck. Oh. That's what a pimple on your butt looks like. Oh. Wouldn't that be a cluster fuck instead of a cluster <laughs> fuck? Yeah. <laughs> By the way, anybody who's watching that, that funny symbol is saying it's enhancing, it's stacking pictures. Get it? Cluster fuck instead of cluster duck. Uh huh. You're funny. I am funny. Yeah. Well, fuck cluster. Looks like just a bunch of dots. That looks like. That's what looks like a heart shaped island, isn't it? Yeah. I hear, why don't we bring yeah. it all the way up? I don't see it. I fooled out. Oh, okay. Is my tongue black? Mm -hmm. No. <sighs> I tried. I like my men and my tongue black. Oh, I don't see a duck at all. Of course, yeah. This is another cluster in the Milky Way, so. Cluster in the Milky Way. Uh, That's pretty cool, though. That's pretty beautiful. Yeah. Look at that. That's out there tonight. Yeah. No one. Oh, yeah. This is right now. Yeah. Does anyone, uh, anyone <laughs> see uh, the um, Whirlpool uh, Galaxy? Oh, there it is. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's it. Yeah. Okay, I'll let him. Ah, eh, I'll stop it. I can enhance it and see what happens. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. It's actually part of a galaxy cluster. But we may not see the other galaxies. Uh, Stefan's quintet is also nearby, but uh, I don't think that'll be visible in the circumstance. Hey, look at that. Wow, how cool. Mm -hmm. That's 7331? That's correct, yeah. It's kind of like a mini Andromeda galaxy. There are other galaxies around it if we 
find a uh, properly enhanced uh, photo on the in, on the internet, but um, I don't think I think those other galaxies are. You might be able to see small. one. Um, I th I think I've done this one before. Oh, there's and, one. And see, down you can see the them bottom. at the bottom. They start to show yeah. up. Yeah, yeah there's there's one there's a smudge spot to the lower left of uh, three three one seven. Yeah, and there's another one even farther left. I've done this one once before, and and the longer you sit, you can start to see a couple yes. of galaxies. Right, that's pretty neat. Yeah, yeah. That's, mm -hmm. that's cool. Yeah, you can, you can actually see the outer reaches of the galaxy. That's that's nice. It was not just the big uh, central central region. Uh, yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah, that is pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's pretty high, so we're not getting a lot of the fuzz. Well, all Tasmuth mounts tend to have a little difficulty on spinning fast enough to uh, get the zenith. Uh, this is probably high up at this hour. Uh. Yeah, well, actually, the the ring is close to the zenith, and it it like any telescope has a little trouble getting there. Yeah. Okay. Find that's, way around. That's pretty good. That's hey, that's really nice, actually. Yeah. yeah. I'm impressed. That's good. That I would say that's pretty comparable to a visual view in a maybe a 12 inch or something like that. Mm-hmm. At least that's from my experience. Except for, yeah. yeah. Well, lot, and would you, would you see I've, the little tiny galaxies as well? Yeah, I can see some of them, yeah. yeah. There's, one to the, there's one nearby to the lower left. No, I was just wondering if you, could, if you could see those on a 12 inch, the little faint ones on a 12 inch. Uh, visually, I would say uh, be hard, hard to see. I, my eyesight's not that good any longer. Yeah, and and uh, so... Uh, uh, maybe the best thing to do is to get to yeah, get a uh, baby ones next to it. get a regular photograph that uh, shows them all and then see if you can mm -hmm. spot them uh, in comparison. So I've done a little look up uh, on 7331 and it says it's an unbarred spiral galaxy about 40 million light years um, away in the constellation Pegasus discovered by William Herschel 1784. Uh, and uh, it goes on to say, let's see, the other members of the group are the lenticular or unbarred spirals, 7335, 7336, the barred spiral galaxy, 7337, and the elliptical galaxy, 7340. These galaxies lie at a distance of about 332. <laughs> Well, let's see, 332, 365, 346, and 294 million light years, respectively. Hey, everyone. Well, thank you very much for logging in and participating. And uh, I think it was a successful evening. Yeah, I think it was fascinating.